Thank you so much. Welcome to Americans Who Tell the Truth, Speaking Truth to Youth. And I just have a couple of questions that I would like to ask you. First is, what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Well, I'm a product of Brown versus Board of Education. I grew up in a community where Black children had been denied admission to public schools um, for generations. There were no high schools for Black kids when my dad was a teenager, so he couldn't go to high school in our county. I started my education in a colored school. And then lawyers came into our community to implement the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education, uh, which banned racial segregation in education. And because of those lawyers, I got to go to school and the public schools. I got to go to high school. I ended up going to college and ended up going to law school because I was impressed with the power lawyers have to protect the rights of disfavored people, disadvantaged people, even when the majority of folks don't want those rights enforced. If you had a vote in my community about whether to let black children attend the public schools, uh, that vote would have resulted in black kids being denied admission because it was a majority white community. But those lawyers had the law and the power to force integration and create opportunities for people like me. So when I uh, went to law school and graduated, I wanted to use that same power to help other disfavored, other disadvantaged people and when I came out of law school in the 1980s, it was clear that people in jails and prisons, people on death row, uh, people were being marginalized and thrown away in this era of mass incarceration became the community that I felt was most vulnerable and most in need. And that's what got me into this work. What continues to motivate you, guide you, give you courage? Well, it's interesting because um, I am persuaded that um, you have to be hopeful to do the work that I'm trying to do. I really believe that hopelessness is the enemy of justice and justice prevails where hopelessness persists. And so your hope is your superpower. And um, I'm now convinced that we have to believe things we haven't seen to create the kind of society we want to live in. Uh, hope will make some of us stand up when people say sit down. It will make some of us speak when others say be quiet. And I'm increasingly mindful of this long history of hopeful people who endure and fight against inequality and injustice. My great grandfather was enslaved in Virginia, and yet he learned to read because he believed one day he'd be freedom. That's hope. My grandparents. Uh, survived racial terror lynchings and, and the menace of that era and still had 10 children, which was rooted in a kind of hope. Uh, my parents endured the humiliation of segregation. Uh, they'd see those signs white and colored and they weren't directions, they were assaults that created real injuries. And yet they had this hope that their children would have opportunities to, to create the kind of just society we've longed for. And that history of hopeful struggle and survival, that's what sustains me. I live in Montgomery, Alabama, where I stand on the shoulders of people who did so much more with so much less. Uh, black people in this community would put on their Sunday best and go places in the 1950s and 60s to demand change and equality, knowing uh, that they would get battered and bloodied and beaten uh, for that activism. Uh, knowing that they did that for me encourages and empowers and energizes me to do what I have to do uh, for the next generation so that we might get closer to the kind of just society, the kind of equal society that many of us are longing for. I'm encouraged by the attention and the, um, the kind of new conversation that we're having about the legacy of racial inequality. There seems to be an openness that we haven't seen even five years ago when people were out on the streets protesting police violence, it didn't generate the response that we've seen over the last several months. And so that makes me hopeful, but I've long believed that justice is a constant struggle. Uh, the struggle must continue if we want this moment to be the sort of movement that pushes our nation to a better place. And that's why you know, the work that we do, the work that others are doing, the truth telling, uh, that this project is about is so essential for how we create the kind of society that 
uh, I believe we need uh, to protect basic human rights. What advice do you have for youth and young activists? Well, I think it's important to stay connected to the communities that are most vulnerable uh, to injustice and inequality. Um, don't let your activism be shaped entirely in a classroom or among peers that are distant from the places where they're suffering and inequality. I often urge people to get proximate to those who are neglected and excluded. If you care about criminal justice, then make sure you're in relationship with people or families or communities or entities that work directly with incarcerated people. If you're concerned about poverty, get proximate to, to spaces and places where and uh, people living in poverty have to cope. Because when you're proximate, you hear things you won't otherwise hear, you see things you won't otherwise see, and, will, and it will give you clarity and insight uh, to, to prevent you from being too academic, too theoretical, too disconnected from the problem to understand the core of the problem. I do think staying hopeful is important, that we have to have uh, a spirit of activism that is rooted in a belief that change can happen. Uh, I, and I ultimately think that we have to be willing to do things that are uncomfortable and inconvenient. Um, I, I look at the history of change in the world. It's never happened unless people were willing to position themselves in uncomfortable places and to do inconvenient things in service of justice. And the last thing I think is that, you know, service has to be an important part of who we are and what we do. If we're not serving others, who are more vulnerable, who are less protected, who are more at risk, then we run the, we run the risk of becoming um, disconnected in ways that makes our activism uh, less responsive to the needs of those who are suffering. I've always believed that I needed to be in Alabama, I needed to be on death row, I needed to be in jails and prisons to do the work that I do. I need to be in community with the poor and the neglected and the marginalized, the disfavored, to do what I do as an African-American uh, doing racial justice work. <clears throat> I wanna be situated in, uh, in black communities and communities of color that are trying to respond to this moment. And that relationship uh, to the communities we serve, I think is gonna be really critical as we move forward. The truth is you can't go anywhere in this country without being in a space that has been polluted by this long history of racial inequality. That smog is everywhere. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Uh, the formerly incarcerated people who've been impacted by that system are everywhere. Uh, we're dealing with all kinds of policies that marginalize and exclude people, undocumented people, people with disabilities, people who are sexual minorities. And so those folks are everywhere. So you're absolutely right. If you wanna get proximate, there's no limit. There's no barrier that you can't overcome. Uh, to become part of this movement. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you very, very much.